Back in 2020 announced as a Kickstarter campaign, The Last Faith promised a dark gothic metroidvania filled with multiple weapons and executions and all sorts of stuff that would bring a breath of fresh air into the genre. Today we're going to be talking about it after my full playthrough of the game. Welcome to the review, my name is Fighting Cowboy. Without further ado, let's jump in. Now, for the sake of the review, we're going to be running through a early area of the game. This is basically the, the second zone right after you reach the hub. So we're going to be trying to keep spoilers to a minimum, but you will see some glimpses of the map and potentially some looks at uh, weapons that aren't exactly early game if I scroll through the weapon list. Thankfully, it's all pixel art, so you probably won't be able to tell exactly what the weapon is. Either way, let's jump on in and... While there are a lot of things about this game that I like, there were a couple things that I think held it back from being an absolutely phenomenal Metroidvania. So to start, we're going to be going through everything that I really enjoyed with the game, and then we'll talk about some of the downfalls. Uh, the first thing that really stood out to me with this game is the weapons. Compared to your typical Metroidvania, the weapons are a ton of fun here. Uh, we have multiple different weapons to choose from, over 10 weapons, and weapons have their own specific moveset. They have charge abilities. They have uh, a unique either transform state or a special on them, and that's something that I think is really unique that we haven't seen in a lot of Metroidvanias. You know, I think to, to Hollow Knight, you're essentially working with your nail. That's it. That's your weapon. Uh, looking at Blasphemous 2, we got our three weapons to choose from, and that was something that was really cool. But having multiple weapons for multiple builds, it was almost a bit more of a uh, Assault and Sanctuary type feel, really blurring the line between a Metroidvania and a Souls-like, and that's something that I found really enjoyable about this. And in particular, I think it's something that promotes multiple playthroughs, because you want to try out other weapons, you want to try out the magic, the guns, and all the different tools the game has for you. Uh, so that's definitely something that really stood out to me, especially the the unique states on the weapons, the specials. Like I ended up using the whip for the majority of my playthrough and being able to, to summon that, that rain of nails. That was something that I found really, really cool. Uh, another thing, as you saw right there, there are elements in the game that we can actually interact with and we're able to, to throw those elements and throw them at enemies and get some damage in. They're not going to do a, a ton of damage, it's not going to be like a one-hit kill or anything, but I did think it was really cool how we were able to find interactable elements within the environment and chuck those at enemies to do damage. Just a really nice little, little you know, kind of flare touch, whatever you want to call it. I thought that was, was something that was really neat. Uh, talking about the game and the exploration a little bit, I think the map design was pretty on par with what you would expect for a solid metroidvania. We have um, really good zone diversity. Some zones have little side areas that you can explore that lead to hidden treasures and hidden paths. Uh, a lot of those paths you're going to have to wait until later till you have all abilities, things like the double jump, things like the, the hook shot you saw me just use. And so the game does completely deliver in that sense. There's entire areas that you can, I mean, there's in particular, there's a couple bosses that you can just outright miss if you're not taking the time to really uncover the secrets. And whether that's something you're looking forward to or not, well, that's a decision you have to make for yourself. Uh, I know in my playthrough, at least, I killed everything with the exception of one hidden boss. Uh, the hidden boss involved collecting a bunch of objects. In fact, we actually just picked up one of them. But the, uh, where did it go? The Unborn Mites, there's a bunch of these in the game, kind of similar to the Cherubs and Blasphemous. And if you get them all, it unlocks a hidden boss, which unfortunately I did not find them all. But that one that I just picked up in this review, I'm still four short. So who knows when I'll get to fight that guy. Um, but despite that, there were, there, the exploration here is definitely top-notch, uh, especially going back through. Zones get significantly easier once you have things like the double jump. Uh, but there were a couple areas that I thought were a little bit weird in the exploration. You have, like, goggles that you can pull, and you, you can purchase these from a merchant. When you get the goggles, you're able to see through certain walls that are, like, invisible. But the thing is, in the game, there's a total of, like, I think six or seven of these walls. So it feels kind of weird to buy these goggles to see through a couple of walls and then they're essentially never used again. I think that's kind of like a missed opportunity in the exploration. I think it would have been good if they also unveiled hidden walls to you so that you were able to like, oh, that's a breakable wall right there. Cool, my goggles told me that. I think that would have been a, a pretty interesting upgrade to that versus you buying it and then having it just work for, for a limited section of your playthrough. Um, but in general, we do have a lot of different traversal stuff. We have the double jump, we have the hook shot. Uh, we have the ability to go up on certain climbable surfaces and, and double jump. We have uh, certain things that we can, you know, we get our air dash later on. So pretty, pretty standard par for course on what you would expect uh, with Metroidvania exploration and kind of going around and looking for, for stuff to do. Uh, on top of that, we have a lot of different variety going on here, just in terms of the general gameplay. So we have our weapons, we have our spells. Instead of using the spells, you could, of course, have... Uh, 
could have on the the ranged weapons which i didn't use those all that much but you could of course work in the ranged weapon and use that as one of your go-to's so if you want to do a more instinct build, blast people with the shotgun, do some big damage there. On top of that, we have a unique ability that we can use. Right now I have one that will, will speed up all my attacks. So you know, this is my, my base attack speed. Uh, if I was to do that buff, you can see massive, massive increase to the attack speed there. And there's a couple of different one of those you can get. You can get a, the ability to parry enemies, you can get a shield, the attack speed boost, and then eventually we have like a unique special that's going to drain that meter and transform us, but uh, I'll let y'all get to that on your own and see how that plays out. Uh, but so, really I think the biggest thing that, that kept this game so entertaining for me is the sheer level of variety. I think in terms of, of playing a Metroidvania, uh, I kind of mentioned this already, but I, I think this, this blurs the line a little bit. It gets closer to like a Metroidvania slash Souls-like, something closer to Salt and Sacrifice or Salt and Sanctuary, where it kind of deviates from the standard Metroidvania formula in favor of more diverse gameplay. And that's something that I think is really enjoyable and really did a good job with this game. Some other things that I found really enjoyable, the music design and the sound design were pretty good. Though this one sting that you hear play when you enter a zone, I'm pretty sure that's the exact same sound sting from the Cathedral of Bloodborne. Like, I'm almost positive. I've heard it before, and I'm pretty sure it's straight out of Bloodborne. Um, oh, a new hidden wall. What are you? Mechanical bomb. Another one? Nope. Uh, but so yeah, lots of stuff like that, breaking walls that you can find, hidden areas, uh, times where you'll go through a doorway and the door will shut behind you and there's challenge encounters. So lots and lots and lots of stuff that you would expect from a exploration rich Metroidvania is alive and well in this game. Uh, on top of that, we have pretty standard leveling. Obviously, this character is way whacked out all the way at 270. I've, I've beaten the game, done farming at this point. So uh with this character in particular, I modded his stats up so that I could test all the weapons. And I have a separate video that, that talks about all those if you're more interested in that. Uh, but we have the standard stats of Strength, Dex, Mind, and Instinct here. Mind is going to increase your mana bar. Instinct is, is focused around gun damage. Uh, strength and Dex pretty straightforward and health. So I do like that we have leveling in this game. And it's, it's pretty simplified, you know, very straightforward. Strength, Dex, Guns, Magic. You know, kind of hard to uh, get confused on what exactly does what there. Uh, besides that, we have different things that we can find, different charms that you can find as you play the game. And most of the time, these are going to give some type of stat increase, you know, crit chance and crit damage, physical damage, physical defense. Uh, some of them are based around elemental. So we do have a, a little bit of build variety going on with the character as well, at least enough that I fully consider doing a second playthrough of the game, trying out a full strength build uh, after the game has launched something I could potentially stream. Um, Moving on from there, I'm trying to think if there's anything else that really stood out to me with this game. Uh, I mean, I've talked about a bunch about the combat, but honestly, the combat in this game is just, just so much fun to do. I know right now we're just insta-giving everything because we're, we're fighting uh, really weak early game enemies. But one of the things I really liked a lot were the spells. There's some, some super, super interesting spells that we can do. Uh, the fire tornado in particular is one of my favorites. I can throw this thing out. And especially against slower enemies, it just does a ton of damage to them. It's going to inflict the ignite status. So we have status effects in the game. We have like ignite, electricity, burn, all sorts of stuff. Uh, and the combat really, it's just, it's very enjoyable here. Very, very enjoyable on the combat front. Um, but despite all the praise, there are a couple of areas where I think the game definitely could have been improved. And I don't know if I would just call it like a difference in the vision of the devs or what the case is, but there were a couple times where it just felt kind of weird with uh, some of the decisions that, that I saw. So uh, the first one up, let's talk about death mechanics. So we obviously drop our resource on death, pretty standard for souls like not all that worried about that. But at the same time, we do have instant death falling off ledges and by spikes. Now this is something that I was not a fan of in Blasphemous 1, and it was changed in Blasphemous 2. And my thing is with a, a Metroidvania, we are looking to explore every nook and cranny, looking for stuff, you know, going all over the map, trying to find various goodies. And, you know, sometimes you may need to like jump off a ledge, like hell, you know what, I'm gonna have to jump off and see if there's something down there. It's the only way to check. But when you instantly die jumping off a ledge, I think that that takes away from the experience a little bit. I think a good example, looking at the map, you know, as I'm, I'm looking through this, like, okay, well, I'm probably going to die there. I'm probably going to die there. But like this one, that isn't filled out. Maybe there's something over there. No, it might be death. Uh, actually, let me scroll the map over here. I'm scrolling, seeing the map for a little bit. Uh, but I think one of the biggest examples is there is a, a area up here in this, this particular spot. 
So I went down here and I went here and I see this. And, you know, to me, this would look like, oh, there's a drop down. And then there's, this is clearly a room. There's clearly a room I can go into and a ledge or something. No, this is all just, just gravity. You go down there, you die. And it's like, well, why, why even have this little, this little nook? Um, or even right next to it, right here. It looks like, you know, maybe there's, there's something that I haven't covered. Nope. I would just have to fall down this ledge and die to uncover that on the map. And little things like that really threw me off in my playthrough because, you know, to uncover that on the map and to see there wasn't a secret there, you need to die. And that's, that's really odd. Now, I get it. They're going for the, the, the punishing type feel that you would expect from a, uh, a Souls-like type game. But the thing is, most Souls-like games function in the third dimension. And because of that, I can look over the ledge. I can drop a, an item down to see, is this safe? Am I going to die dropping off of this? You can't do that in a Metroidvania. So even though we do have the camera pan ability in this, being able to like look up or, or, or look down a little bit to see if something's waiting for us, the only way to really check and see if you're going to die to gravity is to just jump. And the fact that you are going to die when you make that jump is something that I was not as big a fan of. Uh, I think it's it's kind of punishing and a little bit counterintuitive to the exploration. In a similar fashion, spikes in this game are instant kill. Fortunately, there's not all that many spikes, uh, not nearly as much as, as what I remember from like the first Blasphemous. But still, once again, I'm just not really a fan of instant deaths in Metroidvania. So I think instant deaths become more frustrating as opposed to just punishing they make you feel like oh you know if i make a single mistake i'm going to be dead here and as you can probably expect the game is filled with plenty of enemies that will uh, try to, to push you off a ledge or throw something that'll knock you back into spikes and instant kill you so there's lots of cheeky encounters like that and because of that I think it would be more beneficial if stuff like the spikes or or the gravity were more percentage based. Maybe make it take a third of your HP every time you're inflicted by an attack by that. That way, you know, you hit the spikes. If you've hit the spikes twice, okay, three strikes, you're out. You know, something like that. Uh, another thing that I, I actually was not a fan of at all here, if we go back to the main menu, and this was something that I found really weird from a design perspective. When we start the game, we have four different classes to choose from. The main difference here is we have different stats. You know, Brawler starts with more strength, Rogue starts with more dex, this guy starts with more mind, Marksman starts with more instinct. But the thing is, all four of the classes, despite those stat differences, have the exact same start. And I found that really disorienting, almost like, what's the, what's the point? You know, it's a nothing choice. So what I mean by that is we're all going to start with the Nightfall Blade, which is C-Scaling and Dexterity. The Magic class doesn't start with any spells, the Gun class doesn't start with any guns, and it's really, really odd. It's very odd because essentially it's just the illusion of choice. We're giving players four different classes and the only difference between those classes is going to be our starting attributes. And I think that's borderline. It's almost a little disingenuous. It just feels odd, you know, because you, like, if you're going into this game and you're like, oh, you know what? Magic sounds badass. I'm going to play the magic class. And then you start and the game's like, great, your mind is at 15. And you're like, cool, what do I have to capitalize on that? nothing here's a deck sword you're like what like, yes this is your deck sword no i don't get a starting spell or a starting gun for the gun class or anything nope you get a sword and it scales with dexterity like really really eyebrow raising choice there right i can't be the only one that's like that doesn't make any fucking sense why wouldn't you you know especially because there are things like like looking at the the strength build for example you know we have this this is the the starter strength axe you can find it super early in the zone why not just let the strength build start with that? Why not let the gun build start with the, the starter gun weapon that you can find? Why not let the mage build pre-start with a spell? Give them a, a very cheap basic spell to start the game with. Uh, something that's going to allow them to do to do damage. Even if it's designed for that class, it's you know not very strong, whatever the case is. It does not make sense to me that we have starting classes and then they're all the same damn thing. And I know I sound like I'm getting kind of ranty about this topic, but it really bothers me because essentially it is the illusion of choice. It makes you think, hey, you're picking a starter class. And really all it is is about five levels of difference in your initial starting stats. That's it. And so that was something that I found to be a, a really odd design decision, one that I don't I don't agree with at all. Um, Besides that, we already talked about it, but the, uh, you know, the, the deaths from the, the spikes and gravity, when you combine those with the way the map sometimes wouldn't fill out, I feel like those, that was a case of 
issues compounding upon one another because the only way to get that map fully filled out was going to be to sacrifice myself to gravity and since i didn't want to sacrifice myself to gravity i'm sure there are secrets that are hidden throughout the map that i still haven't found but i'm not going to just jump off ledges and kill myself to see if there's something where i can land that doesn't make any sense um, so i think those two things together were, were a little bit weird uh, additionally there were some some really strange quirks with uh with scaling of weapons and upgrading weapons that didn't make a lot of sense to me as I played out. So I think a good example of this is the two weapons I'm using right now. You can see now given this character, you know, as I mentioned already, this is after I beat the game, I went ahead, just boosted all the stats all the way up so I could see what weapons looked like for a weapon video. But the scythe is B dexterity C strength, whereas this is A dexterity D mind, you know, so AD versus CB very similar, but the scythe is all the way up at 840. Whereas this is at 454. That's a massive difference. And what's even furthermore, before I leveled up strength, I didn't even have strength at one point. I had my base strength at eight, and I still had 55 dexterity. And at that point, the scythe was still vastly outclassing the damage of the whip, even though I didn't even meet the strength requirement. And so I'm not sure exactly what was going on there, if it was just a case of, you know, maybe, maybe I, in actuality, I just need to have 30 between strength and dex, and I didn't actually need to have the strength stat to use it. Uh, but either way, it was a little bit weird because here I am looking at a weapon and its stat requirement, and it's like, I don't meet those stat requirements, but I'm still absolutely devastating enemies with this weapon. And it's like, okay, well, I guess it's more of a stat recommendation. Um, so definitely a little bit weird there, having a, a stat requirement that essentially is inaccurate and lies to me. You know, doesn't doesn't matter. Don't need to have that strength at all. Now, obviously, pumping strength more is going to scale the weapon more, but then that brings in the question of what's going on with the scaling, because I mean, this is this is CB, but it's insanely strong. I think uh, another example of this, if I look to, um, you know, let me, let me find a good example here. So like, this one is going to be a scaling. This one's going to be a scaling. But look at the difference here, right? This one, a scaling strength, a scaling strength D mind. Okay, well, this one's obviously a later game weapon. It's a double X. Look at the difference, 689, 1010. Now given, you know, this is more of a late game weapon that we find, but still that is an absolutely insane difference in the damage. And that wouldn't be that, that wouldn't be really seen from uh, just looking at the weapon, you know, looking at the weapon itself or looking at the scaling wouldn't tell you that. You would assume that you're going to be able to do similar damage. And no, it's a case of the starter weapon is very much not going to keep up. You know, starter sword right now, I'm doing 491. Whip, I'm doing 454. And that's something I'm not a giant fan of. You know, I get it. Late game weapons should be stronger. But the fact that this weapon scales up and, you know, Nightfall Blade, this gets up to S scaling and dexterity. S scaling and dexterity, you'd assume is going to be incredibly strong, but unfortunately, you know, 491 isn't going to stack up to just the scythe, which has B scaling and dexterity and goes all the way up to 840. So some really weird quirks here and there with how weapons worked with, with leveling and the stats they were going to get. And that was something that definitely threw me off in the playthrough. Uh, you know, just late, later game weapons were just significantly better by a large margin, so much so that it's not even comparable. Um, and the note of weapons this was another thing is leveling up weapons is borderline prohibitively expensive in this game. So to, to start to level up your, your basic weapons, your non-unique weapons, uh, there's a resource that you can buy an infinite amount of from the blacksmith. So that's good. But the weapons that do split damage such as this, there is a limited amount of resource. So at the end of the game, to be able to check all that stuff, I had to use cheat engine to level up all the weapons so that I could figure out the scaling values on it. Um, but I didn't really like that because I noticed as I was playing through that I leveled up one weapon a little bit and then I found a different weapon that I wanted that scaled with dexterity and that was unique. And then at that point I had to scour through the game finding any merchant I could that still stole that items and then you know, at the end of it I just barely squeaked out enough to fully upgrade the weapon. But it was weird to me how we had an infinite amount of one upgrade resource and a finite amount of the other upgrade resource, especially because like damage wise, it's not like those weapons are, are completely better. I think a good example of this looking at at two of the strength weapons right here, you know, we already saw that that axe that's at, at uh, 1010. Here is just a normal weapon, a normal strength blade that goes all the way up to 1,092. So the special weapons, the only thing that they, that they have that makes them unique is the fact that they innately are going to have, uh, they're going to have an element worked on into the weapon, and that's cool and all, but there's no reason to really gate that resource and make that resource limited 
especially when you know the whole idea is trying out new weapons and seeing what's going to work for your character and what's going to be fun and that's kind of why i did the weapon video in the first place so that people aren't wasting resources on, on upgrading a weapon because on top of that just getting your weapon to max level costs about a hundred thousand resource now given you can farm up resource pretty fast in this game and there are some areas that uh, i was able to pull in roughly like fifteen thousand a minute in terms of farming still a hundred k for a weapon when you're just trying to to level up weapons to test it out if you're looking at, at leveling the weapon and buying the resources and everything you're spending probably about one hundred and twenty-five thousand. and at the point you'd be doing this comparatively speaking that would be like five to six levels worth of experience so uh perspective wise unless you're planning on just spending time farming it is quite expensive and that's something that i feel was also kind of weird i feel like there's there's no reasons to to have the weapon level ups be that costly because if anything it just makes you not want to level up the weapon i feel like you shouldn't ever have to decide between do i want to level up my weapon or do i want to get three levels on my character that's a that's a steep differential there and one that i feel was a little bit off um but we're getting kind of rambly so either way to wrap wrap things up uh, there is a lot here that I really did enjoy the the exploration figuring out the map and where to go and finding all the secrets and fighting the bosses and the challenges and figuring out ways to get through encounters all super super enjoyable all very much top tier what you would expect from a, a high quality metroidvania uh, the downsides are pretty minor but there are a lot of little downsides here you know the map not filling out the instant deaths from gravity and spikes the the weirdness with scaling weapons and the super high cost of upgrading them and, and all that uh, and i think all of those things they hold this back from being a, a proper five out of five so my final score on this would be a four out of five it's still a very good game i still think it's going to be worth playing but there are a, a couple little quirks that you're going to have to get used to with it like you know the fact that you're not going to really be able to see when you fully filled out a zone without jumping off a ledge to kill yourself like stuff like that it's 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 so weird it's so weird because you know, just remove the gravity penalty and and have the zone fill out a little bit easier and then we could have avoided all that but uh either way last faith drops today it is a lot of fun i will say you know i got uh, about 20 hours out of my first playthrough so definitely a pretty beefy experience for a metroidvania and i definitely do want to go in uh, and try a, a strength build and see how that goes compared to dexterity but either way i'm going to wrap this one up on here thanks for coming on by and checking it out uh, if you are curious about the game i'll have a video detailing the weapons and the scaling that they get so you don't end up wasting your resources on a weapon that's not very good uh, and on top of that of course i will have the let's play releasing with two episodes per day so thanks for coming on by and i'll see you all next time